what are the principles of treatment for gastroesophageal cancer? In this video, I'll be discussing the goals of therapy in the context of either curative intent or palliative intent therapy. In previous videos, we've gone through the different subtypes of gastroesophageal cancer, esophageal squamous cell cancer, esophagogastric junction adenocarcinoma, and gastric non-cardia adenocarcinoma. We talked about the risk factors for each. We talked about the global incidence of each. We talked about the symptoms of each. We talked about the primary tumor in terms of where the cancer started in each of those various locations from the esophagus down to the stomach. And we indicated that many of the symptoms that you have from your cancer are from that primary tumor. Then we distinguished between primary tumors that are in the proximal location in the esophagus or GE junction versus the stomach. We also talked about in the setting of stage four cancer that the number of, of places that this cancer can spread to, there are some common places, less common places, and that these also can cause symptoms at their location, and they can also cause generalized symptoms. These symptoms can be heralding in the metastatic site and or the primary tumor site in terms of leading to the diagnosis, and these symptoms can continue to occur throughout the duration of your treatment journey. Symptoms then lead to the diagnosis, and we reviewed the number of tests that are performed in order to help with diagnosis and then also to help with staging. We talked about a clinical stage versus a pathologic stage. Staging that's, that's obtained at the time of surgery is pathologic staging versus staging that's um, obtained at the time of diagnosis with a number of tests that are non-invasive and some of which are invasive to get an accurate stage. We talked about why we stage and that the, the stage first gives us a sense of prognosis. First, in the, in the absence of any therapy, historically, we know what will happen in, given by stage. And then also superimpose what treatments can do in terms of prognosis stage for stage. Secondly, we also indicated that staging is helpful and dictates which treatments we will then pursue depending on what stage your cancer is. We talked about localized stage and locally advanced stages that are amenable to surgery and or uh, adjunctive therapies that are added to surgery to enhance cure rates. In contrast, we talked about ca cancers that at the time of staging are metastatic or not resectable and therefore not amenable to surgery. The former would be considered curative approaches, trying to remove the cancer and treat it with curative intention to eradicate the cancer once and for all. In contrast, the, the situation where surgery is not uh, possible, then this would be referred to as palliative intent therapy. That's not to say that in some cases of the stage four setting, when you have metastatic disease, that we cannot have long-term survival. When we get to the treatment um, situation in the treatment videos, we will note some situations where certain molecular subsets like MSI high and HER2 with their matched therapies can actually lead to long-term survival. And also we'll have a video focusing on something called oligometastases where there's only a few sites of, of spread or one or, or a few, and therefore can sometimes be um, uh, addressed with a curative intent. However, in general, when we're talking about metastatic disease, we're talking about palliative intent therapy. So first, with respect to curative intent therapy, we, we, we talk about the differences between early stage one cancer versus stage two and three cancer. And in the previous slide showed you that because the risk factors for stage two and three are so high in terms of recurrence that we also give perioperative therapy, often chemotherapy before and or after the surgery, sometimes with chemo radiation before the surgery, and sometimes adjuvant therapy with immunotherapy. And so whenever we are considering to do this type of therapy, we're always balancing the potential risks and the potential benefits, the pros and cons of doing this therapy. And in this setting that we're talking about with curative intent, we are enhancing cure rates. And in, at the same time, whenever we're doing anything, whether it's surgery, 
chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or other, there's known potential side effects with toxicity, we call it, side effect from the therapy. And even with the surgery, there's, there's a known, albeit low, but there is a known risk of mortality and morbidity um, side effects from the, the surgery and post-operative complications. And so in this setting, though, where we do know that we can enhance cure rate, we, we balance that with the potential side effects. And therefore, we know that giving higher doses and, and more chemotherapy drugs together, for example, as well as higher doses and longer duration radiation therapy can enhance cure rates. And so there is a trade-off with a known increase in side effects, but at the same time, we're enhancing cure rates. In contrast, when we're talking about palliative therapy in the stage four setting, again, we are always balancing risks and benefits. This is the job of the oncologist. And in this setting, you know, there's still potential benefit, albeit not curative. We know that therapies can improve all of those symptoms that we just reviewed and that it, they can increase survival duration, albeit modestly. And this comes with the potential side effects that we have of chemotherapy and in addition, having to come for therapy um, for a prolonged periods of time. The, the treatments that are perioperative in the curative intent setting are, are a defined amount of therapy for a few months before and a few months uh, up to even a year after in terms of immunotherapy. On the other hand, when we are talking about therapy in the palliative setting, this therapy is going to be on and off pretty much indefinitely. Um, until it's either not effective anymore, there's not enough options remaining, or not tolerable. So um, it's more of a, uh, a marathon as opposed to a sprint in the curative intent setting. And so as such, the treatments are with chemotherapy are lower doses and fewer drugs um, when we're talking in comparison to the perioperative setting. And often the therapies are done in tandem, and we'll talk about that when we get into lines of therapy. Similarly, with targeted therapy and immunotherapy, these drugs are used, um, and each of these has potential side effects, but we try to use these targeted therapies for targeted populations that have specific biomarkers that then push the balance of risks and benefits in favor of the benefits over the risks. And similarly, with radiation therapy, when used in the palliative therapy uh, situation, these are used specifically for, for lesions or, or sites of cancer that have spread that are symptomatic uh, despite getting these palliative therapies. And they're usually lower doses over a shorter duration compared to the therapy that's used in the curative intense setting, again, to limit side effects, but optimize the potential benefits. So focusing then on the curative therapy, we know that uh, therapy with a, a specific regimen to date in, in uh, 2023, the standard of care for gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma is to use perioperative flot chemotherapy, which is 5-FU, leucovor, and oxaliplatin, and docetaxel, taxotere. And um, there's three chemotherapy drugs here. So it's uh, the most aggressive regimen that we have, but it's justified because we do know that it can improve survival rates um, about 10% over the previous regimen, three drug chemo regimen referred to as the magic regimen, which had be previously shown benefit compared to surgery alone of another 10 to 15%. And so chemotherapy on top of surgery adds about a 25% additional cure rate compared to surgery alone. And so although we recognize that there are side effects from this uh, triplet chemotherapy regimen, we do know that we are enhancing the cure rates and, and it justifies the risks. In contrast, when we're talking about therapy in the palliative setting, we, we are looking, this is a, an example of a study that was done some time ago uh, in 2006 that was comparing a triplet chemotherapy regimen with docetaxel, cisplatin, and 5-FU or DCF compared to cisplatin and 5-FU, a two-drug regimen, which had previously been an established standard palliative first-line therapy in the stage four setting. And you can see that the outcomes with cisplatin and 5-FU compared to DCF 
are, are marginally lower compared to DCF. But when we look at the side effect profiles of these triplet drug versus doublet, the, the added toxicity is generally considered not, um, not worth the, the minimal benefits that we're seeing here in terms of survival. So when we talk about the median survival, remember the median survival is the, the time point at which 50% are still alive and 50% are no longer alive. And you can see that the improvement is literally on the order of weeks. And so the added side effects that, that a triplet drug um, in, 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 in adds to the, the doublet chemotherapy is generally considered um, not worth it. Now, that said, there are some longer term uh, patients here that are deriving more substantial benefit with a three drug regimen. And we never say never, even in the first line setting of palliative therapy, where we might consider a triplet regimen like FLOT or Fulfirinox in patients that have, for example, really bad um, symptoms or extreme symptoms or very heavy burden of disease where a response uh, a shrinkage of the cancer is is really desired, we might start with a triplet regimen and then taper down to doublet to try and optimize the benefits over the risks of the therapy. And so this is an example, though, where generally speaking, it's accepted to start with a doublet therapy and then to use all the known agents that are effective in this cancer in tandem over time. And that's something to point out from this study which was done you know, 15 years ago, is that the median survivals are quite low compared to what we now um, see in randomized phase three studies to date, even starting with uh, doublet therapy. And that's because now, as opposed to then, second line, third line, even fourth line treatments are available. And we know that we can improve survival by doing things in tandem rather than putting them all up front uh, all together and therefore limiting the, the side effects and optimizing the benefits. This is in the context just to show that historically, without any therapy at the time of diagnosis of stage four disease, the best with just what would be referred to as best supportive care, just symptom control with medications, pain medications, et cetera, but no active therapy, the median survival was reportedly, depending on which study you looked at, anywhere between three to five months. And so clearly, palliative therapy can improve survival. And now, but the additional uh, extra drug really is marginal on top of that, but does add a lot of side effect. Another thing to point out is this uh, really good study recently uh, done in Britain looked at what about in patients that are elderly and or really frail at the time of diagnosis? Is there benefit to using first-line chemotherapy? And this study randomized patients in this category of being elderly or frail to full-dose first-line therapy with uh, an oxaliplatin-based doublet therapy, or 80% of the dose of first-line therapy, or 60% of the standard dose of first-line therapy. And you can see that overall, there's not much benefit to adding higher doses or the standard dose. Um, and by decreasing the dose, you can get similar survivals, but really improved um, side effect profiles. So optimizing the, the potential benefits um, compared to the risks. And so even in patients that are not up to full dose therapy, there is still benefit to some therapy. And that's shown here in the second part of this study, which um, evaluated patients that were really considered uh, the benefit of added therapy in first line was was questionable. It wasn't clear if there would be any benefit because of their their elderly uh, status and or their poor performance status or frailty. And even in those patients, they were randomized to getting just best supportive care or 60% of a standard dose of first-line therapy. And you can see that patients that did get the therapy had prolonged survival and improved quality of life actually because it treats the symptoms. And so yes, chemotherapy can cause side effects and, and toxicity, but we always remind patients that your cancer will cause symptoms that affect your quality of life uh, negatively. And that the treatment itself, the goal of therapy in this palliative therapy primarily is to improve or delay the onset of those symptoms. And so in this example here, even in elderly feral patients, um, some chemotherapy seems to be uh, better than not. 
So in this uh, video, we talked about the principles of treatment from the perspective of both a curative intent situation in early stages and in the palliative setting in the later stages of stage four. We talked about the goals of therapy that may be different between these two categories where curative intent is with real uh, trying to enhance cure rates and therefore the trade-off of imp increased side effects from the more aggressive therapy seems justified in contrast to in the palliative therapy where generally speaking, the treatment is not considered curative, but it is still palliative in terms of improving symptoms from the cancer and improving survival, albeit modestly. So in future videos, we're going to be going into more detail about each of the therapies, why we use each therapy in, um, in each of these situations of curative intent therapy and palliative ter therapy. So stay tuned. Thank you.